Just late start. We are still just within the Academisches Viertel, so I suppose we're, we're, we're tolerably late. Anyway, welcome to everybody um, on behalf of the British Council and Bertelsmann AG to What Would Dickens Write Today Europe Literature Showcase. Um, it's been quite a week for British culture in Germany. Um, in fact, we had the premiere of Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy at the beginning of the week, and Gary Oldman was here with the film crew. Um, we were in Munich um, just uh, yesterday, the day before yesterday to open a Stubbs exhibition at the Neue Pinakothek, the, uh, the first Stubbs exhibition ever to, to come to Germany. Um, and we have uh, various other events like a um, communicating science event in Hamburg. The pinnacle, the, 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 the real jewel of the week, of course, however, is the Dickens Seminar. Um, oh, I almost forgot, you can't do anything this week without mentioning Frederick the Great. So I, I must acknowledge that too. <laughs> um, this year, our annual Valberberg seminar is different. We're moving with the times. Um, it's dedicated to Charles Dickens, the novelist, journalist, and social critic. One, of course, of the most celebrated British writers of all time, who's influenced film, theatre, music, and art, as well as writers of a wide range of genre and nationalities for 200 years. Dickens, Dickens themes are, I'm sure we already know, but certainly will discover most relevant to a wide range of people today, from cultural connoisseurs to English language learners and for future generations. In Germany, the pageantry around Dickens started uh, last uh, autumn. Uh, we've been running um, a series of, of films um, all in the, the original version um, of Dickens um, over the last few months with uh, Babylon Cinema here in Berlin. Um, and we've been uh, using the British Council's uh, English language materials for, for, for learners uh, to, to help them learn English and learn about Dickens. Um, and of course, um, this event is being live streamed, not only throughout our networks in Germany and Europe, but um, right across the world. We've had quite a lot of interest from as far afield as Australia, United States, Dubai, Lebanon, and uh, other countries in Europe. The event this year is different. Um, as you've seen from, from, from this lovely building where we're holding the event, at the British Council, we are committed to and continue to commit ourselves to working uh, in literature. Um, this event clearly demonstrates the enormous value um, of literature as a vehicle for, for cultural relations. I'd like to take um, the opportunity of uh, uh, thanking Bertelsmann, our game, particularly Dr. Helen Müller and Frau Katrin Brauer, for uh, an enormously um, exciting collaboration. Um, we, we, we've, we've worked over the last few months together to bring this event together, and it's been extremely um, uh, interesting, um, and uh, uh, the outcome uh, you'll have to judge for yourselves. But we value very much this, this partnership with Bertelsmann and hope it is going to become a template, a model for, for future events. It's my great pleasure to um, have the role and uh, the privilege uh, of introducing Professor uh, John Mullen, um, who's agreed to, to share this seminar. Uh, to, to chair this seminar, I'm sorry. <laughs> you, you may well be sharing the seminar too, John. <laughs> um, and of course, a very warm welcome to our enormously distinguished group of authors from the UK, from, from Claire Tomlin, John Burnside, Louise Doughty, Toby Litt, Denise Mina, Philip Henscher, and David Nichols. And of course, not to forget Dame Antonia Byatt, who will be with us for um, the whole duration um, of, of the seminar. She's not here this morning, but she just has an appointment. She's going to be coming just a little bit later. Welcome, too, to Martin Davidson, our chief executive from, from London, and to Rosemary Hillhorst, our regional director from Brussels, and, of course, to our colleagues who have been um, enormously supportive and helpful um, from our literature department in, in London, Susanna Nicklin and Anna Devers. Um, before I hand over to John, let me say a few words um, about Professor Mullen. Um, he is a professor of English and head of the English department at University College London. He was general editor of the Pickering and Chateau series Lives of the Great Romantics and Their Contemporaries, in, published in 1996. 
and associate editor for the Oxford Dictionary of National Biography. He's a specialist in 18th century literature and is currently writing a volume um, on the, uh, of the Oxford English lit literary history that will cover the period from 1709 to 1784. John's research interests also extend to the 19th century, and he's writing a book on the fictional techniques and formal quirks of Jane Austen. Oh, okay. <laughs> in last Wednesday. We're, we're <laughs> half a week out of date, John. I apologize. <laughs> he's also published the books How Novels Work, which examines the uh, technique of the novel, uh, setting novels from the last 10 years against classics of the past, and Anonymity, A Secret History of English Literature. A regular broadcaster and literary journalist, John Mullen hosts the Guardian Book Club, which examines a new book each month. And he's appeared as a guest and a commentator on programmes including In Our Time on BBC Radio 4 and Newsnight Review on BBC Two Television. And in 2009, he was a judge for the Man Booker Prize. Just before John uh, starts this event, let me say a few words of thanks to, to people who have been involved in, in setting this up. First of all, to, to Susie and, and Anna from the Literature Department in London, who have been enormously strong partners with us. To um, my um, own colleagues, I'd like to say an enormous thanks. Uh, it, it is a, a lot of work, which we very gladly do, but um, their, 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 their hard work um, is, 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 is extremely uh, impressive, uh, particularly to, to El Kirit, Matt Beavers and Zerkan, Denise, the team of people around which you don't see much of, who you don't see much of, are actually doing all the technical live streaming. Christiana Kailich, Martin Spies, and Martin Steinmetz. But last and certainly, of course, not least to the star of the Valberg seminar, Marika Brauer. Um, and uh, on that note, um, I'll uh, hand over to John. If you have any concerns, questions um, during the event, then please turn to uh, Marika, Matt or Anna, who will be very pleased to help you. Thank you very much. Over to you, John. Hello. Um, it's lovely to be back. I'm a Germanophile, but I haven't been here for 16 years. So this is a wonderful rebirth experience for me. Um, I hope, I just wanted to say that I hope... Um, that if I do my job properly, you're going to be seeing a lot of me, I'm afraid, chairing event after event. But I will be able to give you the chance, everybody in this room, the chance to, to, to talk about and to ask about both the work of the authors that uh, we're going to be meeting, but also about Charles Dickens, because I take it that we have some enthusiasts in the room, and I hope to unlock that enthusiasm. Um, I was wondering, I was thinking about Dickens's um, continued uh, hold on contemporary audiences. Recently, there was a, a, a very no expenses spared dramatization, yet another, of great expectations on, on British television. Um, and it occupied only three hours in three episodes of prime time on a, on a Sunday evening. And I sat there in cynical middle age thinking, wondering about the extraordinary amount of expenditure of time and of talent and of money to do this, what was, what was evidently the, the, the BBC showing off what it felt it could do best. And it was quite interesting to see the responses to this dramatization because almost without exception, the uh, television reviewers praised it to the skies, said it was absolutely wonderful. And indeed, uh, one of the main political commentators in the Guardian newspaper took up what I take was actually the BBC's invitation to say this proved that public service broadcasting had a purpose and that it should continue to be funded by a generous license fee. And the BBC was vindicated by this new uh, enactment of the Dickens classic. And without exception... All, I think, they, the, the literary bods hated and reviled it, <laughs> said it was awful, and uh, uh, wrote in pain about the, the very many alterations, which, of course, it being television, had been made to the plot of this great novel. Can you believe it? Those of you who were here for 
uh, uh, Antonia Bart's reading last night, that opening scene, which is indeed the opening scene on the TV dramatization, in the latest, sumptuously filmed, brilliantly acted BBC uh, uh, dramatization, didn't take place in a graveyard. <laughs> because somebody had said, obviously, let's think out of the box here. We're doing it anew. Let's do it on a, by a, on a bridge, by a creek in the marsh instead. And to my great pain, uh, right at the end, Magwitch does not go down to the depths, throttling, as I imagine, Compison in the Thames. He stabs him with a knife, which can't be right, can it? That just can't be right. Um, murders are very important. Uh, when we were hearing last night about the, 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 the persistent themes in Dickens' uh, uh, fiction, I expected to hear murder as being one of the ones which we would recognize. It wasn't mentioned. Because I was reading also the, 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 the works of the authors who I'm going to be interviewing in the course of today and tomorrow. And they all seem to have a murder in as well. And I was wondering whether that wasn't one of the very, very many bequests, created bequests from Charles Dickens. Nah, a good book without a murder somewhere in it. There are one or two Dickens novels without murders, but you have to think quite hard after Pitwick to find one. Um, the, the reaction to the TV dramatization seemed to me to sort of encapsulate the two things about uh, Dickens's continued life um, in the imagination of, I think, probably all of us, but also... Uh, I don't know about Germany, but, but, but of people in, in Britain. On the one hand, his books still come alive for readers who are um, uh, very easily upset and offended by the smallest deviation from their sort of wonderful architecture. But on the other hand, of course, something very unusual, um, which any living author would cut off their right arm for, which is that Dickens seems to live for people, some of whom have never read any. That's an extraordinary thing. Um, that um, if you talk to people who have uh, been absorbed by the latest film or television version of a Dickens novel, you will find a lot of them have not read a Dickens novel for a long time, and some of them have never read a Dickens novel or are not quite sure if they have. Have they read Oliver Twist? Really actually read it? Um, and I make that point not at all in the sort of um, uh, the snooty way of an academic who, after all, is paid to read them, which is it's no great achievement to have read them if somebody's paying you to do it. Um, but actually as something really singular about Dickens, that certainly in terms of his characters, they have stepped out, haven't they, of his books. And they have a life, they have a life even in the English language, which has gone beyond the actual experience of particular people reading the books. Um, a Scrooge is a person now, a person we think we all recognize. And there are lots of people who will know exactly, they feel, who uh, Uriah Heep is or the Artful Dodger is, or even in a way who David Copperfield is, without having read the books in which they appear. Um, and that's an incredible thing about, about an author. And in a way, although I was on the side of... Um, of the sniffy critics who didn't like the latest television version. In a way, one should also remember that the fact that so many people watched it and were absorbed by it does say something singular about the author that they are changing, traducing, adapting, that he can survive that and come alive again. Um, I'm going to be talking to... Uh, uh, authors over the next two days, and I've set them, I set them some homework, because you know with authors, you mustn't let them do what they want, 
And the homework I set them was to, uh, they each had to prepare, choose a short extract from Dickens because this was to stop them just talking about themselves too much, you understand? <laughs> and they all had to prepare an extract from Dickens. And then their extracts were, and they will read these in the course of the next couple of days. And these extracts were chosen in order to uh, illustrate their own debts to Dickens, their own interest in Dickens as a living presence. And I was sent all the extracts, and I have been sitting down over the last few days reading our author's books alongside the extracts from Dickens. And in one or two cases, I think, aha, yes, I can see why. One or two cases, I've been quite... It's been quite hard for me as well to work out what the relationship is. So like you, I hope, I'm looking forward over the next two days to finding out whether I have been right to see what the relationship is between Dickens and the work of the authors that I'm going to be interviewing. I'm going to be, um, as my wife calls me, stooge to the stars... Um, so this is my only chance to do my little bit, okay? I have to be subservient now for 48 hours. So as this is my chance, I hope you'll forgive me if I... I'm not allowed to choose any more bits of Dickens. They've all chosen. But I have now taken... I'm taking now the opportunity to give you my little bits of Dickens, and then I will go quiet, okay, for two days. And I was just thinking that... Um, because it's, it's, I think it's important over the next two days. We get in as much Dickens as possible. And I was thinking perhaps I could end this little introduction by, with, a, with just a couple of little bits of Dickens which might illustrate, might suggest why he is such a present still. And I thought of three, three things, and I have a three little bits for each one, or one little reading for each one. Three things about him. The first is that extraordinary gift of characterization. And this is all to do, this is partly to do with the fact that he wrote in a form, serial fiction, which meant that his characters had to, his minor characters had to be with you straight away. And then they had to stay there for perhaps a month while you waited for the next instalment. And then when you bought that next instalment, they had to be with you again, immediately, recognized. And I don't think anybody else has ever had that gift of that instant recognizability of a, of a character. And I am gratuitously giving you one. And I thought just uh, a minor character. I thought as Antonia Byatt was reading last night, it would be very, very sad if we left Berlin without recalling Uncle Pumblechook. I'm sure you'd agree with me. So here, very briefly, is Uncle Pumblechook as an example of a character who immediately appears to you and then can never disappear. And indeed, he does immediately appear because... Pip, you might remember, is recalling how on Christmas Day, Uncle Pumbachoop used to turn up with a bottle of sherry and a bottle of port at the door. And the door is opened, and there is Uncle Pumbachoop at the door. And there he is for you as well. Mrs. Joe, said Uncle Pumbachoop, a large hard-breathing, middle-aged, slow man with a mouth like a fish, dull, staring eyes and sandy hair standing upright on his head so that he looked as if he had just been all but choked and had that moment come to. I have brought you, as the compliments of the season, I have bought you, Mum, a bottle of sherry wine and I have bought you, Mum, a bottle of port wine that image of a sort of oh, recently resuscitated Uncle Pumblechook 
I can never forget. The second thing, of course, I was talking uh, to Melanie, that tr was recently translated Great Expectations over breakfast, how, how hard it must be in German to tr or any language other than Dickens' own to catch the second thing which is so extraordinary about him, which is speech, the way people speak. And there have been great, I think, novelists of dialogue before Dickens, but nobody who had seemed to hear the way people, the very peculiar ways in which people speak. And, and the image of, perhaps it's a rather sentimental image, but the image of Dickens walking around and just listening to voices and then putting them in his novels is a very difficult one to resist. Um, I will give you just a little bit of, currently I think my favourite character in the whole of Dickens, Mrs. Gamp from Martin Chuzzlewit, who is a nurse, so-called, and a layer out of the dead. And her first job seems to often prepare her for her second job, if you see. You wouldn't want her coming around to attend you if you were feeling sick. And she's talking here to a character called Mr. Mould, about this work that she does, attending the sick and the dead, usually in a great sort of fume of gin. I will not deny, said Mrs. Gamp with meekness, that I am but a poor woman and that the money is an object, but do not let that act upon you, Mr. Mould. Rich folks may ride on camels but it ain't so easy for him to see out of a needle's eye. <laughs> this is a test of your English idiomatic <laughs> knowledge. That is my comfort, and I hope I knows it. <laughs> She's fantastic. And that's a great thing. One of the things that Dickens does, which I hope we'll talk a bit about over the next two days, is he, he seems to me he breaks all the rules of sort of polite English prose. And uh, uh, I remember thinking this when I saw the title of, a few years ago of Martin Amis's collected critical essays, The War Against Cliché. No, 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 bring those clichés on. Never has there been a writer so in love with all the things that you're taught when you're taught to write you mustn't do. Use clichés, repeat yourself, um, um, exaggerate. Step into the middle of the story and start hectoring the reader. All those things which tasteful writers have avoided doing for centuries. Dickens does them all. And Mrs. Gamp, with her muddled idioms, is a, she's a poetess, really, isn't she? <laughs> um, and finally, don't worry, this is my final thing, but it is Dickens, not me, really. Um, I was thinking when Antonio was reading yesterday evening of what it is that, in his descriptive prose, makes Dickens so extraordinary. And how sort of untrue it is, really, that we still read him because of his concern with poverty and money and the pains of childhood. And all these things are true. Um, but there was a bit in the, towards the end of the last chapter of Great Expectations, which most of us here heard last night, which seemed to me to catch uh, what's special about Dickens. You remember, you see the gibbet, and Pip says the man was limping on towards this latter as if he were the pirate, come to life and come down and going back to hook himself up again. It's kind of weird flight of fantasy. And I think that in English, anyway, linguists, I've asked them, those who study linguistics, don't have any word for the figure of speech in English which start, starts as if, or Dickens sometimes writes, one might have thought, and then he's off, isn't he, into some weird, unnecessary, fantastic fantasy. Um, and I'll give you a couple of little examples to end with, and then I will go to being the stooge. Um, a tale of two cities, in a tale of two cities, we're in Dover, waiting 
for some of the characters to come back from France. And uh, uh, um, we're, we're in the streets of Dover. And completely unnecessarily, Dickens decides that he'll describe Dover to us. And he says, The air among the houses was of so strong a piscatory flavour that one might have supposed sick fish went up to be dipped in it as sick people went down to be dipped in the sea. <laughs> There's a current idiom in English, which I'm sure you're this fantastic sort of shame-making for us grasp of the English language that Germans have, which never find in reverse in any English audience. I'm sure you know the idiom, what's that all about then? But I often feel that's one's response to Dickens. Why is he doing that? But isn't it wonderful, um, that sort of flight of fancy? And I thought I'd give you one other little one to end with, which also has all these other wonderful faults of style, which nobody had dared put into literature before Dickens came along. Listing, exaggerating, repeating himself. And it's a passage from Dombey and Son describing the effect on Camden Town of the building of the railway. And it's very vivid to me because I live now very close to where all is now lots of viaducts and tracks. And it's a bit of North London completely sort of bisected and trisected, is that a word, by railways. And you can imagine many 19th century novelists describing beautifully and accurately how what had happened. But here is how he does it. As to the neighbourhood, which had hesitated to acknowledge the railroad in its struggling days, that had grown wise, that had grown wise and penitent, as any Christian might in such a case, and now boasted of its power for a proper, prosperous relation. There were railway patterns in the draper's shops and railway journals in the windows of its newsmen. There were railway hotels, office houses, lodging houses, boarding houses, railway plans, maps, wrappers, bottles, sandwich boxes and timetables, railway hackney coaches and stands, railway omnibuses, railway streets and buildings, railway hangers-on and parasites and flatterers out of all calculation. There was even railway time observed in clocks, as if the sun itself had given in. <sighs> <sighs> Anyway, I'm now going to do the proper business, which is to introduce you to Claire Tomlin, who is going to speak, first of all, before I, I ask her some things. And then everybody here will have a chance at the, in the last 15 or 20 minutes to, to, to say things or ask things. Claire um, probably is the most famous biographer writing in English. And her special gift, I remember having it exemplified to me in the, in the, in the 1970s when her, her first major biographical work, Life of Mary Wollstonecraft, was published. And I remembered in the course of a week noticing that my mother and my very snooty uh, tutor at university were both reading it. And I remember thinking, this is inconceivable. My mother, who was very anti-academic, uh, uh, anti and this academic, who was very anti-populist, and they were both reading the same book. And I remember thinking there how extraordinary it was to, to reach across that very wide audience. And since then, she's written on Jane Austen, on Catherine Mansfield, on Pepys, most recently before Dickens, a wonderful biography of Thomas Hardy, and now on Dickens. And uh, Claire's going to come to the lectern first, I think, yes, and give a little talk, and then we'll have a little discussion. Claire.